Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody uh, across the, the globe. We are happy and honored to have another event in the uh, Instituto Superior Technic, the School of Engineering of the uh, Universidade de Lisboa and the NHKD Joint uh, uh, Distinguished Lecture, featuring a panel of uh, six eminent speakers, including the ACM president, Gabriele Anders Kotsis, the IEEE Computer Society President Forrest Schul, the ACM Turing Award Laureate by Barbara Liskov, the Communications of the ACM Senior Editor Moshe Vardi, and the IEEE and ACM Fellows Nuria Oliver and Ricardo Baeza Yates. We are focusing the discussion on the future of computing following the pandemic. What are the issues that are most pressing right now? We listed seven non-exhaustive lists, in, including the future of computer science, uh, science education. It, uh, the computer science education has evolved over the years. What are we not teaching? Once assembly language was part of the common computing curriculum, it is no longer. Should we stop teaching software engineering? What is the future of associations such as ACM and IEEE Computer Society? Should we downsize? Should we support online events and stop offering additional services? What will happen with uh, conferences? Are we back to the future of uh, presential events? And uh, when will we reach gender balance, diversity and inclusion in our proceedings in the societies and academia? Um, is the software profession the next victim of uh, machine learning slash AI? Do we need new privacy laws from politicians or do we need to change our curriculum? And do we need fair algorithms? And for these questions, I yield now to the uh, panel, uh, starting with uh, Gabriela and the Scotsis. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Let me start with sharing my vision on the future of computing, because this will set the ground for my answers to the questions that you have just raised. I don't dare, of course, to project the future in detail. Nothing is more risky and prone to error than predicting technological change. Um, I would like to start my statement with saying that I have a positive look ahead in general and also specifically for our discipline. So my first answer is no, I'm not afraid of being threatened by machine learning and being replaced by artificial mach machines and I will elaborate on that a little bit later on. It is definitely true that we are facing a lot of challenges and changes in our society. But again, this is not something new. This is something that even characterizes mankind, I would say. And we have always been creative to overcome those challenges, to cope with the changes, and last but not least, to provide appropriate technology to help have better lives, have uh, more healthy lives, and have a better society at all. Just as a very recent example, look at the changes and challenges that the COVID pandemic outbreak had on all our lives. We are now used to Zoom sessions. Um, we do think that we have mastered the technology, still sometimes something goes wrong. But nevertheless, these um, immediate challenges have shown also how tremendous the efforts and the achievements are that we have seen from research in many perspectives be it medical research with vaccination against COVID, be it um, research on the simulation of the pandemic outspread, which is to the core of um, computer science technology and computer science knowledge, be it um, also our means of communication. Just think about how the situation would have been if the pandemic would have um, struck us 10 years ago and all those tools for communication have not been that elaborated. So I truly believe, and that's my positive opinion for the discipline, that computing machinery is one, and if not the most important tool to cope with those challenges that we are facing. And it's not just the pandemic. It is also fighting the CO2 dilemma, for example. And we have again seen that COVID has a certain positive effect because we are traveling less and we're reducing the CO2 outtake or um, output. But nevertheless, there are still a lot of things to do in that field. 
fertilizing medical research and healthcare. And again, no medical research, no healthcare would be possible without computing machinery, without our technologies, be it the processing of data, um, be it the analysis of different treatments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as a third challenge, I would like to mention also computing machinery to protect democracy, because um, communication tools, participatory tools, electronic communication, dissemination by means of electronic and social media is a very powerful tool and can be used to ensure democracy. But it can also be used in the opposite, to hinder democracy, to prevent the free expression of opinions. And this brings me also now to the question of the role of, of computer societies, because I think we as computer societies are challenged by providing a platform for free speech, for open speech, for diversity, for inclusion. Um, I've mentioned or I've postulated the statement that I think that computing machinery is one of the most important tools to cope with the challenges. I also want to say that I do not believe, although we see a lot of advances, and this was also one of the questions, that artificial intelligence is the solution to all of those problems. My vision for future of computing goes far beyond just applying artificial intelligence. Not all problems will and should be solved by means of artificial intelligence. But I do believe that an increasing share of work will be accomplished by more or less intelligent machines. But we still need to consider and focus on what machines are good at, like, for example, number crunching. We have reached nearly 500 petaflops as a benchmark nowadays. We are scratching on the exaflop. And I do remember when I started studying computer science, we were only challenging the teraflops. So the amazing speed increase is still um, surprising to me. Computers are good, machines are good at storing and processing large amounts of data, they are precise, they are good at repetitive behavior, and they learn to recognize patterns. But they still have very specialized application domains, we don't really see general purpose AI, and maybe it's not also not meaningful to generate or generate those kind of, of general purpose tools. What do machines lack? Well, machines lack Luckily, what we are strong at, namely creativity, we can build machines that try to produce art, that try to compose music, but the machine itself will never be creative. It's just us, the human beings, who make the machines creative. Machines lack empathy. We as human feelings care about each other. Machines don't really care about each other, and they shouldn't. It's not their objective. We are ambitious. We are curious, which are very key aspects for a researcher and also a very strong human attitude, we are able to forget. This might sometimes be annoying, but it's also very helpful. Humankind would not survive without forgetting. And machines are really poor at forgetting, at least at the moment. So if we see the strengths of humans, the strengths of machines, then my true belief is that the future of computing is in human machine teaming. This is apparently a new discipline it goes far beyond human machine interactions, more than just the interactions, really focusing on the tasks that humans are good at, that machines are good at, and how those two can be best combined. So what are the implications of this, my vision on the future of computing? Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of detail um, on the first question because the implications are apparent for teaching. I will probably have the time to comment more on that later on, but I think we definitely need to adapt and modify our curricula with that respect. Um, currently, a lot of our curricula are still based on facts, on data, but this is what machines are good at. They can retrieve the data for us. We as humans, we have, to have the capabilities to interpret the data, to transform the data into knowledge. And although we talk about machine learning and knowledge processing, the true knowledge generation is still a human capability and a human function. Um, I do see also implications addressing one other of the questions that you raised in your introduction, that we need to rethink not only conferences, but also in general, the way how we collaborate, share and discuss our research work and findings. In order to find the right answer to that question, we have to identify and meet the needs of the community. And again, then we can bring in what computers are good at, technology is good at, and we can bring in what humans are good at. Computers are good at um, storing the data, helping us retrieving what we are looking for. 
So I do believe that in the future, our research output will be continuously fed into digital repositories, not only by means of papers, but also by the actual tools that we have developed, by the software that we have developed, by the data that we have produced. And those repositories should be accessible for all. We must prevent gatekeeper functions. We must really ensure that research results that are intended to be for the public are actually accessible by everyone. We need to allow everybody also to contribute, and this relates to the topic of inclusion. And we need to provide a forum for discussion, either in person, remote or hybrid. And this is really what the humans are good at. So I truly believe that we still will have conferences and physical meetings in the future, because we all know these um, special topics that are not adequately addressed by means of electronic communication, electronic means. But maybe it is the end of the traditional conference formats as we know it. I do really expect that the various disciplines and subdisciplines hopefully more engage in a continuous cooperation throughout the year. And then there are maybe local events, maybe one global event with remote, with hybrid access, with physical access. So I do really see an interesting new um, variety of um, collaboration and communication coming up with respect to our research, replacing the traditional format of conferences. Last but not least, I would like to address the impact for global organizations like IEEE or ACM. Um, again, the key point would be to identify and meet the needs of our community. And here, I think it will be especially challenging to focus on the next generation, to focus on early career people. These would be the millennials nowadays. And from my experience, I found that they are, they are very willing to engage, but I think um, you can confirm that they not necessarily tend to join organizations just per se, just because it is common practice that you join a computer society organization. If they engage, they first of all expect a clear return on investment. They want to engage, but they also want to see results. They want to see benefits, clear benefits for their own career, um, for their personal lives, and they want to change. They are not happy anymore with um, communities that say, okay, we hear you, but we don't really listen to you and we definitely are not going to change. Everything is stay as it is because it has been always been that way. So I think really the young generation is an opportunity for us for this model of change that is definitely needed. And if I talk about change, then we need better mechanisms to integrate the whole community. We need better mechanisms to adopt emerging topics, new topics that are coming up. Currently, maybe the structures that we have in our organizations are too rigid with that respect. And last but not least, our community is diverse by nature. We are global, we are worldwide organizations. So we represent various kinds of gender, nationality, um, individual beliefs. So we are all individuals, all very diverse, but we really need better mechanisms and have to ensure the implementation of inclusion. This would be my initial statement and I'm looking forward now to the other statements and then an inspiring discussion. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, Joachim gave us a great set of challenge questions, and so I'm probably going to end up talking very fast today because I wanted to hit as many of them as possible. I thought they were great conversation starters. Um, and I'll also mention at the beginning of the talk that it, we've been doing a lot of thinking about um, where the future is going and where our, our uh, IEEE Computer Society is going because this happens to be our 75th birthday, our 75th anniversary year. So we've come quite a ways in 75 years, and we've been thinking a lot about where we're, where we're headed from here. But what I'll start with today, uh, in, since we're talking about the future of technology, um, I'm going to start with the concrete and then move out to the, the more general, because one of the things I've been really pleased to have been a part of over the last year or so is a study that we've done at Carnegie Mellon, looking at the, trying to chart out a future roadmap for software engineering research. And so I can, I can talk about software engineering because that's my field, and I'll, I'll maybe have some very concrete things here. Uh, the study report, by the way, is not out yet. So if, if any of the things I say sounds um, intriguing, consider it a, a teaser and uh, look for our report once it's there. But uh, this slide tries to summarize a lot of the themes we've been seeing. And so 
on the left side, you know, a lot of talk and a lot of discussion we've had in the community about where we're headed in terms of the new types of systems that we're going to be building. And so I won't talk to you about all those specifics, but you know, I, I think the larger point here is that what we've had in software is, is this continuing pushing of the envelope. That is every advance that we've ever made in terms of uh, being able to engineer our systems better with higher quality and, and so on. As, as we move the engineering field forward, that set of expectations for the systems that people want uh, in whatever doing, whether it's consumer electronics and government and, and healthcare, uh, continues to advance as well. So we're always in a mode of trying to catch up. Uh, and I think sometimes that uh, makes it hard to see how far we've actually come. And we certainly don't see that stopping. So I think looking into the future at the types of systems that people are going to be building and the, the level of quality that they're going to be expecting, I see that only continuing to expand. On the right hand side are some of the, the technical themes that we've seen from the talk. And like I said, I won't go through all of them, but one thing I wanted to say is, again, we've seen a, a, you know, from across our community in the US at least, a, a lot of focus on AI as being one of the enabling technologies. So I'm gonna come back to that in a moment because I thought that was a great challenge question that Joachim gave us. Um, but I was gonna say more than what, you know, we, we have a set of expectations about the, the, the qualities that software should have, availability, reliability. Uh, and I think one of the key things that we've seen over time is that set of expectations is expanding as well. So it's not just that we're building more sophisticated systems, but we have to deliver the capabilities more quickly. You know, that is that those time horizons are becoming much smaller. And so not only do we need exquisite engineering, but we need that exquisite engineering to happen quickly and be able to push things out uh, to where they're needed. Um, we look at the systems that we're building and we say, oh, I, I mean, one, one thing that's clear, and I think Gabriella touched on this very nicely, is the idea that they're now having a societal scale impact. You know, when we look at misinformation, disinformation, what's happening on social media, uh, privacy. And I think that um, the, the set of expectations is leading to a new set of quality attributes, you know, that people have expectations for, uh, you know, for privacy, for transparency, for ethics in the systems that weren't there before. And so we're seeing continued, continued growth in the, the challenges from that point of view as well. And then the last thing I'd like to mention just on this slide is, uh, Gabriella mentioned many times community, and I think that's exactly the right way to, to think about this. And we, in the Computer Society, have been thinking about the community of the people who are pushing the envelope and advancing the technologies, but also the community of folks that are that should be using these advances. And so making sure that we're communicating out to the workforce, you know, that we're we're not only pushing the envelope, but but pushing the pushing forward the state of the practice because people have access to these great developments and great engineering things that we've um, helped move forward. So one of the things that Joachim had, I think, phrased it today is, is AI a threat to software engineering? And I think quite the opposite. I, I'd say it, people are looking for it as an opportunity. Um, Gabriella said it very nicely when she mentioned human machine teaming. I think the way we've looked at it in terms of our study is looking at AI and ML as a, um, a trusted collaborator, you know, as part, to be part of the pipeline along with the human developers of software. And I think the Opportunity here is this is the way that we can finally ma manage to catch up with those continued expectations that are out there uh, for doing this at scale and doing this with speed. So why why do I tell you all this? Well, because it, it, this is a nice concrete way of looking at things. And you think about all these exciting advances we're seeing in software. And from a professional society view, that's just one, one of our communities among many. And so I tried to on the slide here kind of I, I'm very proud of what we've done in the computer society about the level of growth, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the number of people that we've touched around the world. I mean, similarly for ACM, it's not that we're unique in this, but I think that um, supporting these communities, making sure that what's happening in software engineering, for example, is, is being able to continue and that community is talking to each other is super important. But I think one of the, the roles that maybe becomes more important in the future for our professional societies is the crosstalk among our communities. That is, none of these things happen in, in a stovepipe in isolation. Um, one of the things that ACM and, and the Computer Society and all of our professional organizations can really do is to support the crosstalk among them. Um, again, going back to my, my knowledge of software and where software is headed, you know, it doesn't happen either just with one segment of our community. Uh, where the way that we're going to address these needs and these challenges is not by having academics working just among themselves in that community. But it really needs to be a collaboration among academia, industry, government, uh, and I think that our professional societies are the, the one place where some of that comes together so that we really can have the crosstalk that's needed to make those advances. 
I thought it was clever um, just to put forward a little bit of data about where we've come and where we've gone. So at least from the Computer Society point of view, uh, we started with a single conference back in 1956. And today we have 210 technical conferences every year, uh, 65,000 attendees. And of course, if you're like me, that picture on the right of the, uh, the, the people in the before times all kind of crowded in uh, makes you a little nervous today, but hopefully we'll get back to that at some point in the future. Um, but the, the reason I bring this up is because I see this trend only continuing to go forward, you know, that continued specialization, continued arising of new communities. Uh, and we need to have a home for them within our societies, but we also need to make sure that they're talking to each other and can leverage the, the benefits coming out of each of those communities to get where we need to go. Okay. Similarly, in terms of publications, and I, I come from pubs myself, so I had to include some pubs data here. Uh, IEEE Computer, our first periodical, was published in 1973. Twelve years after that, we expanded the, the portfolio and added seven more. Uh, and where we are today is 37 uh, peer-reviewed publications with 30,000 new papers coming into the digital library every year. Uh, and as you can see from the footnote there, if you can read the small print, um, that, that the pace has only been accelerating over time. So again, providing a way not only to get access to this, but to help manage it. I mean, this incredible increasing pace. Um, obviously, if we get time today, I, I think we'll talk about open access and a lot of the transformational things that are happening in publications. But a lot of that is, uh, I, as I see it anyway, uh, really related to making sure that our research communities can keep up with the speed of expectation for you know, what engineering has to happen. So again, speed being a central, um, a central um, issue and a challenge in everything that we're doing. And how do we manage to keep that the goodness of the peer review while continuing to speed up and, and make sure that the information and the content gets out there as needed uh, is, I think, one of the challenges that all of our societies still have to deal with. Um, so that, that's the good news. I think, you know, I also wanted to look today and say, where do we need to do things better, at least from a computer society point of view? Uh, and I was privileged last year to, read, to lead our um, strategic planning committee. Uh, and we identified, you know, from across our society, some of the areas where we really need to put a renewed focus on doing and doing things better. Uh, I think first and foremost, at least in my mind, was um, diversity and inclusion. You know, that is, we we really again have this notion of community. Why do we need professional associations? Well, because they're supporting the community. Um, but you know, we also have to rep to remember that some segments of that community have not been well represented in the past, and that's something that we need to do better on going forward. Uh, where we're, what we're doing about that is looking at things both on the volunteer side, uh, you know, we're looking at additional volunteer opportunities, we're looking at being more inclusive and how the, um, the whole community gets to be a part of our volunteer leadership. But I think it's also a technical area of study uh, in and of itself, you know, that's worthwhile. And so I, I put here, uh, one thing I was very pleased with was a, a recent issue of IEEE software looking at the diversity crisis in software development. Uh, and we've done similar things within our annals of the history of computing, for example, looking at some of the causes and the trends over time. I, I, I believe that diversity and inclusion is important. It's not something we're going to solve overnight. And I think it requires a lot more uh, painful choices sometimes than people give it credit for. Thank you. But I think that making it part of that, that and the community and the area that we focus on is important. Uh, beyond that, making sure that we're engaging more with industry. Like I said, you know, if we're doing the best thing in the world in terms of the advances in engineering within our community, but we're not getting that out to the people that should be using it, then we're, we're really not serving that entire community the way we should. And so we're looking at that as well, but uh, you know, kind of targeted events like the Intech one last year. And then uh, Gabriella mentioned this as well, making sure that we're serving the up and coming uh, leaders, you know, the, the next generation of software and, and computing professionals, uh, if we will. And their needs, uh, as she said, are, are not the same needs that certainly that I had coming up. And we have to make sure that we're listening to that and doing things appropriately. So we're doing not only things like the hackathons and the student competitions, as you see here in the picture, but also making sure that we're providing mentoring opportunities So make sure that we're really being open and inclusive about bringing these folks in and, and hearing what they have to say. Uh, and then I'll, I'll finally just end up with, uh, again, as I think we'll be talking a lot about today, um, from where I sit in Washington, D.C., and the government circles that I'm privileged to be a little, have a little bit of access to, I see a real interest in computing technologies in a way that I've never seen before. I think people, and Gabriella said this very well also, people are recognizing that the technologies that we produce have huge societal impacts. 
<laughs> and so I, anyway, I think that having that conversation here by providing volunteer opportunities, uh, by provide, bringing the community together through standards and making sure that we're providing the roadmap for where these technologies are going is an important way for us to be part of that conversation and to bring our members' voices into this in a good way. So thank you. Looking forward to the Q&A and our, our other speakers. Good afternoon, everybody. I've enjoyed listening to the previous two talks. And um, so now I'm gonna talk about my perspective. Uh, and I plan to talk about what were called questions one and four, uh, but things were renumbered. However, this has to do with the question of what should our curriculum be in software engineering? And is machine learning gonna make uh, software engineering obsolete? Um, and I just wanted to talk about, start by talking about program methodology, which is what I think software engineering is primarily about. Programs have to work 100%. And uh, it's very hard to design big programs to find the proper modular design that enables the fundamental uh, thing that we need in a big program, namely the ability to reason about our modules one at a time. And this is a huge intellectual endeavor. And I don't see machine learning taking this over anytime soon. Um, I agree with what Gabriella said earlier about what humans are good at and what machines are good at. And this is a design is a very creative process and it's a very difficult intellectual process. And I think we're gonna be doing it for quite some time to come. This doesn't mean I'm making any predictions about what's gonna happen at some point in the future, but I'm talking about now. Um, we've made huge progress in the area of program methodology. When I started working in this field in 1970, uh, there was what was called the software crisis. This meant that programs didn't work and it was very common to pick up the newspaper and see a headline that said company X had spent hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars and hundreds of man years. It was always man years in those days. And in the end, the program did not work and they had to throw it away. And this happened through the 60s, the 70s, even into the 80s. It's not the case today. Today, programs really work. And actually, Gabriella's example of Zoom was interesting because Zoom had little problems as it came on board, but these kept getting fixed and fixed and it got better and better. So programs work very well today. And that is because of the work that has been done on program methodology in the past and the courses that we have taught in software engineering. Even though I know by talking to lots of people in the software industry that programmers don't follow the rules as well as they maybe should. So programs need to work correctly. Uh, this requires very good program design and therefore courses in program methodology are still needed. And I say program methodology here because I've never been quite sure what software engineering meant. It has, seems to have incorporate more stuff, but this I think is the key thing that the student should be learning from these courses. Um, but maybe they could have some help. And this is related also to what I think Gabriella was saying. Uh, the big problem in programs is recognizing when there are errors and getting rid of them. And compilers don't help all that much with this. Compilers are very good at understanding syntax. And so they can get rid of syntactic errors when you run them. And they understand the semantics of the program structures, but not the semantics of the program. And in fact, compilers are perfectly happy to do optimizations that are basically wrong because they violate assumptions that the program, perfectly reasonable assumptions that the programmer is making. So it would be nice to have some help with this. As Dijkstra said long ago, testing, which is the main way that you get rid of bugs, shows the presence of errors, not the absence of errors. And what we're trying to do is in fact, prove a negative. We're trying to prove that the errors are not there. Program verification is clearly a help and it has advanced tremendously since the old days, but it's not ready for proving the correctness of huge systems. Um, maybe there's some kind of programmer assistance coming. Now, uh, this is actually a really old idea. Uh, people in AI were working on this in the 80s. It never worked, uh, but of course the technology has come along a long way. Uh, I'm not thinking here though of what they were thinking about then, which was sort of synthesis of small algorithms. Uh, I'm much more interested in what can be done about the design process as a whole, what can be done to help people understand whether uh, a program meets its specifications, even if this is a bit fuzzy, 
uh, just understanding better the global structure of the system also probably help in finding what's available in program libraries because uh, program libraries take care of a lot of the problems that people used to spend a lot of time thinking about. So that's my take on that. Um, and now I wanna move to what was called question five, uh, which was about the privacy laws. Uh, and I'm not really gonna talk about privacy laws, but I'm gonna use this as a way of talking about some other stuff. Um, just like everybody, I don't like the idea of companies selling my data. Um, but I wanted to talk briefly about uh, what's going on in systems in the area of privacy and security, because these are very hard problems, uh, not ones that machine learning is gonna solve anytime soon. Uh, when somebody decides that they wanna remove their data from a system, from some company's uh, system, uh, the laws say, at least some of the laws say that all traces of that data should be gone. Technologically, that's very difficult to guarantee and people in the systems area are not sure how to manage something like that. Clearly, if you encrypt everything in some sense, maybe it doesn't matter and maybe homomorphic encryption is gonna help. But at any rate, this is still a technologically very difficult problem. Even worse and harder and more important is security because how much does it matter that a company is following the laws and not exposing my data when some malicious attacker comes along, gets into the system and steals it all. And by the way, program errors are one of the routes by which those attackers get in. So the more we can get rid of those tiny errors and programs, the better off we are. Of course, that's not the whole story, as we all know, because we have to worry about phishing attacks and so forth and so on. Anyway, the world of security is still a very active research area and one that is of great interest to many people in the systems area. Now, as Gabriella said, and I really took this to heart during the pandemic. Uh, one of the things that was nice about the pandemic was that it made clear how important the accomplishments of computer science were. And as Gabriella said, think how terrible it would have been without what we had today. There we would have been stuck in our houses. Uh, how did we work remotely? Did we talk on the phone? We couldn't have entered stuff over the internet. Uh, what would we have done about those meetings that we couldn't have? Today, we have the technology that allows all this to happen. Although I speak from experience here that meetings are no replacement for in-person. Online meetings are no replacement for in-person. There's a difference in the quality of the communications there, but nevertheless, much better than it would have been without this stuff. So um, great stuff, but unfortunately also big problems. And this is not to denigrate the advances that are coming. I mean, I absolutely agree that what's going on in AI and medicine uh, is fantastic. You know, the fact that we now have robots assisting in surgery, the fact that we can do better diagnosis because of machine learning programs that look at, uh, you know, various uh, you know, uh, breast exams and stuff like that. These are all fantastic uh, uh, things moving forward. But another thing that to me has sort of come to the fore in the last two years is a lot of the problems that we have in our systems. And here I'm thinking really again, more in the software systems area. So the first one is the implicit bias in ML. Um, it was actually stunning to me when this first came out that people couldn't see that bias was there. I mean, the early claims that said, oh, we have a program doing this, so we don't have to worry anymore that there's gonna be bias in the selection process. When of course that program learns about what happened in the past and copies what happened in the past. So that's not good. So that's a big deal. Bias search is also a big problem. This is not a machine learning problem. This is an algorithm problem having to do with, if I click on a, yeah, okay, if I click on a link and so forth. Okay, and fake news is the one that worries me the most of all. So what should technology do about this? And what are our responsibilities? I, we are responsible to do as much as we can. And I know a lot of progress is being made on the first two, um, but not on the fake news. And I'm worried about the fake news problem. Uh, we heard yesterday that uh, Facebook has still banned Donald Trump and people are already saying, but what about my right of free speech? Free speech is something that we can technologically help with because we can understand the truth from a lie, but without legislation, we have to, we aren't, it's not exactly clear where we're gonna go with this. So that's basically what I wanna say, except as far as computer science curriculum is concerned, we need 
courses in ethics. And thank you very much. So here is my summary of the situation. It is the best of times, it is the worst of times. It is the age of wisdom, it is the age of foolishness. It is the epoch of belief, it is the epoch of incredulity. It is the season of light, it is a season of darkness. It is a season of, 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 it is a spring of hope. It is a winter of despair. We have everything before us, we have nothing before us. We are, we are all going direct to heaven, we're all going direct the other way. Of course, I didn't write this beautiful paragraph, it's just a paraphrase from the first paragraph, a tale of two cities by Charles Dickens, but I think it represents what's going on today. On one hand, you know, this is the, the abstract for this panel, and I'm not going to read it all, but I agree with, we have new and compelling ideas that transform the future of computing. Computer science research is evolving in many directions with important links to other disciplines. So this is the best of times in some sense. But it's also the worst of times. And we have multiple crises, and some of these have been mentioned before. And I'm going to focus here on what I call three crises, the, the enrollment crisis, the social crisis, and the association crisis. So what is the enrollment crisis? These are the numbers of a production, degree production in computing in the United States. And you can see that between 2015 and 2019, the first number, we went from uh, 17,000 to 29,000 production of, of a, a bachelor's in computer science. We almost doubled, and now we're 2021. So, so we are practically have doubled by, by the time the numbers would have come out, maybe next year we will have doubled. But if you look at PhD production, it is barely budged. I, you can almost say it's not, it's not moved, it's just statistical noise. And, and the PhDs, are most of them are going to, to industry. So we have a huge crisis. Who is going to educate the computer scientists of the future? And on top of it, NSF data tells us that about 80% of graduate students in the United States in computing are international. And 90% of the graduate programs have a majority of international students. So at least in North America, I don't know what are the numbers in Europe, it will be interesting to compare. In North America, we are simply not educating properly, and we're not creating the faculty that will educate, educate the computing professionals of the future. And that to me is a national crisis. The social crisis. I want first to, to, to mention the so-called tech clash, which came to my awareness when I read in October, 2017, and column by Peggy Noonan, a well-known columnist in the Wall Street Journal. And she talks about gun ownership and the argument was not convincing, but that paragraph to me was, was a really an eye opener. She wrote, because of all, why do people want to own guns? Because all of the personal financial information got hacked in the latest breach, because our country's real overloads are in Silicon Valley and appear to be moral Martians who operate on some weird new postmodern ethical wavelengths. And they will be the new, the ones programming the robots that will take all the jobs. Now, you may think that this is a hyperbole, but on January 6th, we almost lost democracy in the United States. You know, it was not, we would not have been very far that, for example, that Nancy Pelosi would have been, could have been killed, the vice president could have been killed. And, uh, and before it was mentioned that, that the computing can help democracy. But what we saw is that right now it looks at social media is a threat to democracy. And this is on us. This is technology that we have produced and it threatens democracy. And uh, we all, no, I don't know we all, but many, many of us had a sigh of relief when Donald Trump was kicked off uh, from, uh, from Facebook and Twitter. But Gizmodo, a kind of a tech publication, had a special, special issue. Are we living in a tech dystopia? And here is a, a cartoon where you see the progressive thinking big tech for shutting down the insurrection. At the time, big tech is, is described as an octopus sitting on top of Congress. And you may say, well, the industry has a problem, but we're in academia, we are okay. And the answer is we are one community. We are joined at the hip. 
we educate the students who go to the industry, we receive significant amount of funding from the industry, we do consulting from the industry. The, if you look at association, I believe that the majority for both associations are from the industry. Many of the awards are in industry funded. We are joining the heap. What happened to computing? We cannot say it's industry, it's not us. And this leads me to talk about the association crisis. And again, it's a confluence of multiple crises. So it is very clear that the membership wants to see the association go into open access. And ACM has, has embarked on a transition process where in five years, it will be open access. But it is a significant change in the business model. And it's far from obvious it will be successful because we are basically asking a much smaller set of institution to shoulder the, the, the burden. I mean, you look at least that uh, if you want this to be revenue neutral, you're asking for a massive transfer of the cost from a, a large set of institution to a much smaller one. And we'll see how well it goes. The climate crisis, now we are, we are now understanding that we must take it very seriously. I think COVID convinced us that ignoring nature, we do it at our own risk. And it means that this massive travel machine that we've created cannot continue. And that means that the conference business must evolve. And publication conferences are the two major revenue sources for our associations. And the boss have now to, to change in a significant way. Now, the social crisis, as I said, we cannot ignore it. That means that to me means association must accept social responsibility. It's our technology that has benefits, but also has cost. What are we going to do about it? I, I can't talk about uh, IEEE, but I know the ACM, it's a non-trivial uh, challenge to say, what, what, does, what do we do about it? How does the association accept social responsibility for the adverse impact of computing? And this leads to the, to the following crisis, which is the membership crisis. As has been mentioned before, the Argent generation computing professionals, they're not association joiners. They find many other ways to feel part of the community, but they are not joining the association. If you look at the growth of the field on one hand, and the associations are growing in a very, very slow pace. It means that generally younger people are not joining. And to me, this is significant threats to the associations. And I will just mention the column that I published in the, in the communication of, of the ACM, the agency trilemma. I encourage you to search for it on the web and find it, but it's part of the conversation about the association crisis. So obviously we are, change must happen. And I will finish with this cartoon. A politician asked the, the, the audience, who wants to change? Everybody enthusiastic about change, but no one wants to change. Obviously, if we want change to happen, we must change. And this is a very, very difficult proposition. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening and good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here and it's an honor to share the panel with such distinguished scientists, including a Turing Award winner. Uh, so in my talk, I'm going to focus about one dimension that hasn't been um, perhaps mentioned uh, too much so far, which is that computer science needs diversity, equity and inclusion. So many of the panelists before have emphasized how you know, we live in this um, highly technolo technological world. Many authors refer to it as the fourth industrial revolution. For the first time in our history as a species, we have a very intimate relationship between the digital world, the physical world, and the biological world. And this revolution is enabled by a lot of engineering and computer science uh, disciplines. Moreover, I am convinced that we won't be able to survive as a species without the help of computer science. We won't be able to tackle most of the challenges that we face today without the help of computer science, which is not the solution, but will necessarily be part of the solution. And because of the ubiquity of computer science in today's society, I think my first message is that beyond the technology, we do need to consider four additional dimensions when we are talking about computer science and when we are teaching computer science. We need to consider the legal and regulatory frameworks where all the software and computer systems are going to be used. We need to consider the ethical dimension, which has briefly been mentioned. We need to consider the, the challenges in education at all levels, 
not just uh, uh, university education. And also we need to take into account the profound transformation that is happening in the um, uh, economy and in the labor system. But all the predictions anticipate a really rosy future for computer scientists. Uh, there's going to be a growth in computer-related jobs. Uh, every um, institution is predicting very similar uh, statistics. Uh, there will be a lot of new jobs related to technology. And because of the advent of artificial intelligence, there will also be a lot of uh, completely new jobs that will be different from uh, the jobs that we had so far. But all of them will have some kind of technology component to them. And in fact, one of the challenges that we have, and I completely uh, agree with Professor Vardy's comment, is that we don't have enough um, uh, young people that are actually choosing to learn computer science. And we don't know what we're going to get all these uh, people to actually fill all these technology jobs. And when we look at um, um, uh, diversity, then we realize that not only we have an education gap overall, but we have an extremely worrisome um, education gap when it comes to uh, women and other minorities. And here it shows the percentage of females in different degrees uh, in computer science over like uh, several decades. And we can see that in all the degrees, uh, the percentage of females have been increasing over time, except for two, uh, for one degree, which is computer science, where there used to be almost uh, 35 percent, even 40 percent of women in the mid 80s, and the percentage of female students have been declining uh, in um, in the U.S. and in Western Europe uh, since then. This is another example for Spain, and when we look at other um, uh, groups beyond uh, males, females, and we look at uh, Hispanic or Asian or African American, we find that the percentages are ridiculous. We also have an employment gap in terms of diversity. So I talked about all these hundreds of thousands of new jobs, but when we look at who is taking those jobs, we find that the percentage of uh, females and the percentage of other minorities are really, really small, and they don't seem to be growing you know, fast enough. Um, the percentage of women in the technology companies is roughly around 20% or, or less. And when we look at African Americans, it's significantly lower. And then we have a retention gap in our field. Not only we are not able to attract uh, enough um, uh, women in this case, but also we are having a lot of difficulties to retain uh, them. So 56% of women in technology positions leave them, not because they stop working, just because they changed their path. And when we look at the women uh, that studied computer science, only 38% actually go into the field of computer science compared to 53% of the men, according to the NSF. So we do have a very serious retention gap. We also have an entrepreneurship gap. When we look at the minorities, and this is an example for women, which uh, we are not a minority, <laughs> we are half of the world. Uh, so, and we look at the startups, we see that, you know, 70% of the startups don't have any woman in the board of directors, and more than half don't have any woman on their leadership positions. And less than 3% of the venture capital funded companies are led by women, even though there are several studies that have found that women led startups or diverse startups clearly outperform non diverse led startups. And finally, we have a visibility, a leadership, and a recognition gap. We still have a salary gap, even in the computer science sector. We have a clear visibility and recognition gap. For example, the Turing Award has only been given to four women in its up to 4% uh, of all the awardees, which is three women. And we are really lucky to have one of them here today, which is completely underrepresented given the percentage of women that there are in computer science. Or going closer to where I live in Spain, the Spanish Royal Academy of Engineering, which I'm a member of, only has four female members out of 60 seats. And we also have a leadership gap, not only in technology companies, but also in academia, where we don't have a, a lot of uh, strong female leaders that could be an inspiration for the next generations. And this diversity is extremely costly for our society, not only in monetary terms, which is also very costly, only in the US in the hundreds of billions of dollars, but it's also very costly to us as a society, because we know that the technology that we all use 
and that the technology that we need to solve all these challenges is not going to be inclusive enough, is not going to be innovative enough because of the lack of diversity in the field. So we are really missing a lot of opportunities in addition to some of the challenges that have been mentioned already, like, for example, biases. So why aren't we able to attract more women and more minorities you know, and be more diverse in computer science? This is a very complex uh, a, a question to answer, but very quickly, I wanted to share with you four key elements that I think contribute to this daunting picture. First of all, unfortunately, there are plenty of stereotypes about who works in technology, what the profession is about, what computer science, how computer science is being taught, and what society expects from girls versus boys, from female versus male teenagers. And those stereotypes are reinforcing the idea of you know, computer scientists being mainly male with you know, low social abilities, you know, doing obscure things. And they don't really emphasize, as I did in my presentation, the incredible social uh, impact that computer science has and the potential that it has to actually um, continue to progress and improve our society. We are all subject for gender biases. And those biases make us systematically um, infra um, appreciate women versus men of the same level, so with the same characteristics. And this is something that affects all of us, men and women. And that there are several studies that have uh, illustrated how, if you simply change the name in a curriculum, um, uh, you know, the male. Um, candidates are rated much uh, better than the female candidates, even though the curriculum is exactly the same. And why this is important? Because in many countries, like for example, in most of Western Europe country, uh, European countries, uh, computer science uh, in many places is called computer engineering and engineering degrees have the reputation of being, being very difficult. So a lot of the teenage girls and their families apply this gender bias and they think that they are not qualified to study these degrees, even though they might have the best grades in their high schools. So we really need to try to combat these gender biases. As I already mentioned, another barrier is that we don't have enough role models. And uh, in general, minorities and, 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 and females, we have a lack of recognition and visibility as illustrated by the, uh, by the gender gap and so forth. And then unfortunately, um, the computer science sector, the tech sector, has a, a, a terrible misogynistic and sexist culture in many circles called the programmer culture that is uh, making a lot of women actually live it. So what can we do? So I think, and we can discuss this further in the, in the conversation. So I think we need to work on all these dimensions. We really need to change the stereotypes about, you know, explaining what technology is about, what computer science is about, how we teach it, and also what kinds of expectations we have from girls versus boys. We need to be able to inspire more girls and more diverse and um, uh, sets of people and minorities to um, uh, join computer science. And something that I've been advocating for many, many years is that we introduce computational thinking as a core subject since first grade. I think we need to be aware of these gender biases, but also uh, promote gender blind evaluations, for example, and reward diversity. We humans are really good with rewards. And generally, whatever is rewarded is done. So if we reward diversity, I think we will achieve more diversity. I think we need to demand transparency and we need to demand diversity in recognitions and promotions and, and awards. And we really need, and this is very hard to work on changing the culture, uh, this culture that is actually making a lot of uh, minor people belonging to different minorities and a lot of women leave uh, the tech sector and computer science as a field. And I think we can all contribute to proving this reality and we all need it. So I think it's right now time to act. Thank you. So hello everybody, it's very hard to be the last one after the, the great company I have and, and the great presentations. So I will try to answer several of the questions that, that, that Joaquim posed, uh, not in the same order, and, and also will touch uh, issues that were already uh, touched by other people. And it's great that, that uh, Nuria answered so well the question about diversity and inclusion, because I, I, I don't have anything more to say, uh, only that, that maybe here I'm representing uh, the rest of the world if we don't include the US and Europe. So. Uh, before, before I start with the answers, I think we should recognize our professional biases. And this is one point that hasn't been touched. 
So for example, here are things that we do all the time, uh, some in research. Um, the first one is we're looking at big data and deep learning when 99% of the problems in the world will never have big data. So we are overlooking most of the real needs of most countries and most problems. Uh, the same about bias. Can bias be transferred from people to code? And I use uh, I used in the past an example that was done near the Virginia, but recently uh, some people in Norway show that basically uh, the bias of the coders can be transferred to the code, which I think is a is a much more deep problem because it's a, like indirect bias. And in evaluation, we have a lot of biases. Uh, the worst one is the last one choose the right baseline, and then you have your, your paper accepted if we're doing research. So I would suggest to watch this uh, documentary, very well done, that is available in Netflix, Coded Bias. But bias is not the only problem. Uh, I have been also discussing in, in my talks about noise. Noise is, is a problem that may be even worse than bias, and, and I'm very glad that finally Daniel Kahneman and, and his colleagues are publishing this month, this book on noise, it will appear in the middle of May, because I think noise may be even worse than bias. So it's noise in human decisions. So let me answer the question about regulation. So, so there was a question about regulation and then a the, the lot of things that happened, maybe for some political agenda, but I think these things will continue in the US, doesn't matter the government. Uh, there are other problems that we haven't focused on, on data symmetry, on, for example, digital markets, I think we need to worry about. Uh, I'm really worried about this, this problem of fair markets where uh, everyone has the same opportunity. So bias is not only affecting people, it's also affecting uh, business. And there was a question about privacy. This is my short answer. Does GDPR solve the privacy problem? Mostly, but the problem with GDPR is that we have one shoe fitting all. Doesn't matter if you're a multinational or a, a small business. Doesn't matter if you're working in health or you are working in the military industry, maybe not there because doesn't apply there and so on. So the question in regulation is uh, many people say, okay, we can auto-regulate, I haven't seen that now, but let me put an incentive, uh, the incentive against. If we don't do auto-regulation, insurance companies will do it for us and that will mean everything will be more expensive. So I hope that's a good incentive to do it ourselves. Uh, in the future, the US may have some more regulation in these topics, and, and these are four laws that, that were basically turned down, one from, from the current vice president uh, during the Trump era, and I hope to, to see more things coming in the US uh, on, on AI regulation. And also very recently, we had the EU proposal for AI. I think this, this uh, panel should have some, some uh, discussion about this. This is my summary of all the points in, in the proposal, like transparency obligations, governance, code of conduct, many things are very important to our profession. And if we go to the text, I want to highlight uh, Article 5 in the Title 2, where it says what we shouldn't do with AI. And, and the main one here is the, is the same A and B, it depends on who, who is suffering the discrimination, but basically, don't use subliminal techniques beyond a person's consciousness to distort the person's behavior that may cause physical or psychological harm. There's a lot here. So um, it's a fast food, something that we can't advertise, or depends if the person has a problem uh, of obesity and so on. So this thing, if, if it happens, will affect all the world like GDPR, and of course has good things and bad things. Uh, also, it's a good to see if first time a list of high risk AI systems where we have to uh, look at. One problem here is that what is the line between high risk and low risk? Uh, one part of our bias is that we always try to categorize things. When we categorize something that's a continuum, we get into this problem because things that are near the threshold may have trouble. Um, I have been working on, on, on all the properties that the software can have. Here is a list, my own list of properties. Uh, the ones that are underlined were in the 2017 ACM statement about transparency and accountability, uh, these seven. And I have them uh, organized in seven, in six, in six big things. So one is about the awareness of the software itself. 
everything about the data, everything about the completeness of the system. And you see that here, it, there was nothing in the NCM statement because they were, they were worried about responsibility, not about a good software. There's nothing on usability. So very important, what will be the user experience, what people can do, and then was more in transparency and responsibility. And, and there's some cultural differences because transparency is more for, for cultures that don't trust government, while accountability is for cultures that do trust government, and then the trust and institution will tell you the truth later. And then this is what we need. If we even in a world that is so complex, we need to do governance. And here I'm borrowing uh, from Ben Schneiderman, uh, his nice diagram of uh, one proposal way to, to do this governance uh, yeah. in a team, in an organization, in industry. And, and it was nice that many of you touched the problem of how we do software engineering. i not from software engineering, but one thing I know is we need to learn how to do software with the help of AI. So we don't have this dichotomy that you see every day we need to choose between the humans and the machines. No, we need to work together and that's the solution, but we need to know how to work together. And I will get back to that. In the near future, we, I want to see more uh, transparency algorithms like uh, racing algorithms that is already being done in Amsterdam, Helsinki. We will see more on auditing algorithms. And here are some reasons to, to audit algorithms. And there are several companies, not too many, but a few in the US and Europe that do this. Uh, and it was very nice to see one paper from uh, some colleagues in Northeastern that presented a real audit to a hiring company uh, because in the US there are some recommendations of what is the uh, diversity they should have when you consider hiring. And this was presented in, in fact 2021 in last month. So we will see more of this and how to do all this and, and what they mean and maybe if it's a marketing strategy for that. And then we have the, the, the question, uh, the last question in, in of Joaquin. Can we, can we, so I, I will change it. Can we have fair algorithms? It's not that we should have, I think we should, but the problem is, can we? Well, we know that fairness is very hard to define. And also we know that, that many fairness definition, definitions contradict each other. So in the sense that you can optimize one, but not the other. So, so it's very hard to have a fair algorithm that will be fair in all possible ways that you want them to be fair. The same with ethics. Ethics is something that really is something human. So sometimes we're asking machines to have human uh, uh, characteristics. And of course, we need to teach ethics of technology. Uh, I think Barbara said it already. Um, very important, we have to remember that ethics is a network. It's not something that is just about you or about your company. It's about your clients, it's about your providers, it's about the government, it's about everything. So it's, it's, it's more like privacy. It's a collective thing. It's not a collective, I don't believe it's a collective right, but it's, it's a collective uh, characteristic. And the only way to do this is to have a real board of ethics. At least 50% will be external because otherwise you have a conflict of interest. And then I prefer to talk about responsible algorithms, not about ethical or fair algorithms. So it should be responsible and they should try to do the best they can. Uh, yeah. So can I, algorithms ever be ethical? Here, Hazel Henderson, asked this question and you can read her answer. And of course, there's something obvious that David Lauer says, you cannot have AI ethics without ethics. We need to start with ourselves first. I'm talking about that and the problem that, that happened in, in Google uh, with a set of uh, colleagues, we wrote this paper on towards intellectual freedom in AI ethics global community. So what we can do now, so here there's some recommendations that will skip through, but basically awareness awareness of the that the user is aware of what's happening and the system is aware of what is happening all the problems of bias and noise start with uh, the solution starts with awareness um, so some recommendations designed for people first that means uh, the first question you have to ask is would you use your system if you say no uh, there's a problem if you say yes maybe there's a bias Disrespect for limitations of our system. This is very important. We don't, many people believe that we can do many things with AI that we cannot do. Cross discipline evaluation, very important. And, and, and Nuria mentioned this, this thing. We cannot have software designed by people that don't really know the problem that is solving. So we need to work with other disciplines. And very important again, 
I don't want to feed humans in the loop. I want to see humans in control and machines in the loop. We want, I want to see that we are in control because otherwise uh, you can say, okay, it's not my issue. Um, so I will finish with a joke. I see not thanks to Moshe to put, I was not sure if to put this cartoon. This is my current worry. This is the present. I'm not worried about artificial intelligence. I'm worried about real intelligence. Uh, this, you see it in politics all the time. And then why? Because if we don't act now, like Moshe said, we have in this point where we can go to heaven or to hell, um, this may happen. So this uh, robot is asked this question, prove you are not a human. And the robot says there are no more humans. And the system says correct and all they laugh. And it's not because the robots killed us, it's because we killed ourselves. So I hope this doesn't happen, so please act. Thanks everybody for the outstanding uh, position statements. I think we have uh, half an hour left uh, with the overtime that we went. And uh, these were five, uh, six dense presentations. And um, since uh, we are talking about ACM and IEEE, uh, Moshe uh, outlined this uh, crisis that we are going to. Uh, I've uh, seen optimistic statements about where we are. But I really see these challenges about uh, the newer generation not being so associable uh, as uh, the previous generation was. And on the other hand, all these calls to action say that um, uh, maybe associations should uh, step into bigger shoes and uh, make themselves heard. We've heard the need for regulation. We have the, heard the need to uh, continue and uh, improve the curriculum. So I would start with an easy question. Do you think that societies are coming are uh, becoming in uh, uh, a challenge to develop a, a larger role or to uh, take on a larger role in the society? For example, I remember all of the uh, ACM councils taking on the advice on policy. I'm sure that IEEE Computer Society is also working on this thing. So if, should we need new legislation to regulate companies? Should we press to have the computing profession as being regulated? Because a civil engineer does not, is not allowed to uh, uh, exercise uh, his or her job without a proper certification. Our part should we uh, go as uh, uh, associations in terms of pushing forward these uh, uh, regulations? How well can we interact with the public and politicians to make these changes happen? And um, I would start with uh, uh, Gabriel and then Forrest. I think this is a, a job for ACM and IEEE. Yes, maybe I can start and I hope there is not too much delay because I'm currently seeing my video a little bit shattered. So I hope the connection is good. Um, I'm not very much in favor of regulations, to be honest. This is my personal opinion. I rather do believe in the responsibility of the individuals that are involved in the process. So I don't think that it would be a good idea to have for the computing profession similar rules and regulations like we do have for other professions. Nevertheless, I would say that we, and if I say we are now talking about we as organizations, we should really have um, a strong impact, a clear articulation from our technical perspective. And as it has been mentioned in the other presentations, we must team up from experts from other fields, from other disciplines. Nuria had this very nicely in her slides. We must address, we must talk to those other four columns. We are not the experts in those other four columns. We are not the lawyers. We are not the ethical experts, but we need to talk to the community. And this relates also a little bit um, to what we have been also discussing to how we teach our students. Because if we only teach our students to speak the technical language, they will not be able to communicate with the people from the others. So I think our task would be to be open, to talk to each other, but also to learn how to talk to each other. This would be my first answer. Forrest? 
Yeah, but first off, I think the question is excellent. Uh, and to my mind, it goes back to what Ricardo said, because I think he really summarized it really well. Um, when he mentioned about industry saying, uh, let's see if I get the thing here. Um, if we don't regulate ourselves, someone else is going to do it for us. And Ricardo's, you know, I think was saying that in the context of industry, you know, putting something out there. Um, like I said, where, where I've seen it is really on the, the government side. I, I think that the, the technologies that we've been creating um, you know, they come with so much benefit, but they also come with so much risks. And that has now, you know, been recognized at the highest levels. Um, now, the good part, though, is that um, what I've seen now through both the, you know, both of our administrations in the U.S. in the last several years is that there's a, a, a willingness, you know, to be reaching out to the technical folks to have them be part of the conversation. And so I think Gabriella was exactly right, you know, when she said that we're not the lawyers, we're, we're not the people that have the expertise there. But we absolutely have to be part of that conversation. And I hope that that's something that our professional societies can do. I mean, I think we've already done it in, in you know, bits and pieces, and we have to be a little bit more conscientious about it. That this is our opportunity to be part of the conversation. This is our opportunity to ar articulate what's technically meaningful and technically doable uh, before somebody goes off and makes a decision because they recognize the threat. You know, that, and if we're silent, they'll make the wrong decision. So I, I would say that there's a hopefulness there, at least on my mind, that they're willing to listen, you know, that we can be part of the conversation if we're willing to speak their language and meet them where they are. Uh, and, and before I give up the floor, the other thing I wanted to just briefly say was to come back to Moshi's point um, about the engagement of the young, uh, young professionals. I think he's absolutely right that they're not joiners, you know, and, and so we often see that after people get out of the university, that, that segment of our membership is really um, underrepresented. You know, we're not really attracting a lot of the early career, or we're not attracting as many of the early career professionals as we should be, I think. But I also think that maybe we're being too um, fixated on the idea of membership. Uh, that if we if we meet them where they are, you know, if we're offering things like mentorships, like job fairs, like the things that we can really uh, provide value to them, they will come and they they will take part in those conversations and they will take those services a la carte. You know, so maybe the membership is not the critical thing. If the question is, are they part of the community and can we reach them and make them be part of that conversation? I, I think we can absolutely do that. So we need to think a little differently about it though. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a, a couple of uh, questions here for Barbara and the provocation from Ricardo. That was also on my mind when I drafted that I uh, provocative question of will machine learning kill software engineering? But uh, Ricardo answered with something uh, that I would like you to comment, Barbara. Will we evolve a new generation of either hybrid programming languages or uh, that are not totally uh, natural language, but I think that's what Ricardo was implying when he said, can we use uh, AI machine learning to increase the efficiency of programmers and do better programs and uh, even maybe better certified ones? Um, so that was what I was talking about when I started to talk about the programmer assistant. Uh, what's completely unclear to me is what this actually means uh, because it doesn't work to have an imprecise description of what you want managed by some code that doesn't actually get things 100% right. I mean, even if it got 100% right, what's it gonna do with that imprecise description? So it's not gonna be that. It's gonna be something that enables a designer to understand better the ramifications of the design decisions. Or it might be something that helps somebody who's looking at a large piece of software understand interconnections. For example, programming languages don't enforce encapsulation, unfortunately, which is actually critical to independent mm -hmm. reasoning. But you could imagine that the right tool might be able to find violations of encapsulation, and that could be very useful to the programmer. So if I were still doing active research, I'd probably be looking at this area. But exactly you know, what form it's going to take um, I don't know that it's, you know, AI with the person, but it's AI as a tool to help the person. And it may not be AI, it could be more like search or something like that. Who knows? Interesting question. Okay. Uh, let me see. Moshe. Uh, Moshe, thank you very much for your tale of two computers. It was really a, a nice metaphor uh, to pick up the best of times and the worst of times. So we're living in times of great opportunity. 
to take on the uh, the first part of the metaphor. And the question is, so can we use uh, a blockchain to enforce software contracts? Is that the way that we can uh, increase transparency in our, uh, assuming that we have to develop a social contract? That is the, the gist of my question. You're on mute. Okay, blockchain is really about distributed trust. And I think the, you know, George Schultz uh, just died recently. He passed yeah. 100. And he managed to write actually a, a, an essay in the New York Times or Washington Post just a few months before he died. And he says, I learned one thing in my life. The most important thing is trust. And uh, we are living in an area of declining trust in in institutions, in people. And uh, we are partly, partly responsible for that. Because, uh, so one of the question is, for example, can we use mechanism, you know, ba Barbara mentioned, you know, fake news. This is a huge issue. We have been obsessed with reducing friction. What happens when you reduce friction? Will the system become less stable? It's become very easy to disseminate fake news. And fake news is more clickable than real news because it's a clickbait. So you click it more easily. So it's our responsibility to come up with, with solutions that will, but we need to talk to social scientists about we understand what are the points where we can have a positive impact. Just reducing friction for its own sake is not going to work it. We need to understand how do we use technology in a way that is compatible with human nature. And I think we ignore that aspect for too long. And we need to have, again, we're not going to be the expert, but I think I agree with other people. We need to have a broader conversation. Right now, unfortunately, blockchain is connected, is again joining the heap to Bitcoin. And I'm just horrified that we are still allowing people to make money by putting carbon in the atmosphere. I, I don't understand why we are not saying this should stop now, okay? Should we find other solution to, to uh, distribute the trust? Absolutely. And people are working on it. And I think it's very important because we've, we've increased the bandwidth and the connectivity of society and we need to figure out how to create trust in such environment. But unless we figure out a way to do it without destroying the planet, we should not do it. Thank you, Moshe. Julia, you had your raised hand, sorry. Yeah, no, I wanted to um, uh, uh, mention when we're talking about um, regulation and, and the role of the associations, uh, something that we haven't uh, really touched upon, and I think it could be an interesting topic, is the unprecedented power and the unprecedented share of the U.S. market by technology companies, uh, something that is really um, out of the charts. I mean, the top five, you know, six technology companies in the US um, have a, an incredibly large percentage of the um, uh, sort of like US market. And I, I, I'm not sure we've been in a situation like this before. So um, of course, um, when you were talking, um, for example, Ricardo, about having ethics boards where he has external members, right? I mean, the power that these companies have on society, on every aspect of society is unprecedented. And um, I don't believe that self-regulation um, is uh, gonna do anything because it hasn't done anything so far. <laughs> uh, so um, I would be interested in, in uh, hearing your thoughts about what role you know, professional societies which have a large percentage of their members being also members from industry, but you know what what role maybe they can play in this um, um, scenario where computer science dominates the world, really. Um, so I don't know what your thoughts are about this. Also, there is the so there is not only the institutional polarization, meaning that the, the ones that are dominating the world are companies, a handful of companies, there is also the geographical polarization. They happen to be US-based companies and then their Chinese equivalents, leaving the rest of the planet in a complete void. Um, and I don't think that is positive 
as a, as a species, you know, for the planet. Um, but of course, uh, I would love to hear, you know, what your thoughts are about this and, and, and what you think would be a sensible uh, way moving forward. I mean, I have emphasized how important it is for computer science to be diverse and to be inclusive, but this is a huge challenge, I think. Okay. Um, thank you. Ricardo, your turn. Yes, I, I also wanted to say something about regulation and, and, and thanks Nuria for the question because basically uh, it's related to, to what you were saying. Uh, so first, I think that there's always we do this binary question like should we regulate or not? And the answer is always in, in, in the middle. For example, for me, uh, if we are regulating things like drugs or, or other things that may affect people, I will do the same. I don't want to have full regulation like uh, civil engineering. But civil engineering has full regulation because we live in this structure, so we, we can be harmed by, by not doing it right. Imagine in like in Chile, we have earthquakes uh, like hundreds per year if we don't have that. So, so the same could be true for computer science. So if you are doing a software that may harm uh, 2 billion people, for example, uh, I will not mention whom, uh, the question is, uh, should we regulate that? For example, uh, this is related also to how many people that understand the problem is doing that, that, that software. For example, my question will be how many psychologists work in every social network company and uh, how much decision power they have on affecting the behavior of so many people. Um, I, I, I may, maybe I don't want to know the answer because I will start crying, but, but these are the problems. We, 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 are not, we are solving problems that other people should be solving. And this is the first ethical consideration we need to have to, if we want to auto-regulate ourselves. Okay, I will yield the floor to Moshe. Seem to have something pressing to say, please. I, I want to amplify. You're okay. My, I, okay. I want to amplify the problem that the association, associations, associations right now have with respect to the, to, the, to the industry. Okay, the industry is huge and powerful. And association are connected at the, you know, for example, the Turing Award, I believe is still funded by Google. Am I right, Gabriel? It's still funded by Google, or it was until at least last year, okay? Well, Google is a company, I would say I personally find its business model, which is surveillance capitalism, is unethical. Now, Google has now erupted in ethical scandal over the last few months, because they're trying to pretend at the same time that they're ethical company. And this cognitive dissonance is tearing them apart. And one ACM, one ACM conference, Fate Star, already said, we do not want Google as a sponsor. Mm -hmm. So this, this issue, the, the tech clash is being now forced on the, we cannot ignore this. This is happening. And I have to say, I do not envy the people who, like Gabriel, who, and, and, and Forrest, who have to make a hard decision. It's very hard for ACM to say, one conference can say, we are, we are kicking off Google. It's much, much harder for ACM to say we don't want a relationship with Google. I think it's impossible. But the same way, we cannot ignore the fact that these companies are viewed more and more as unethical, unethical actors. It's perfectly legal. My, my, I always said if society wants them to stop, the issue should be regulation and not complain about ethics. But it doesn't mean that we have not acknowledged the basic business model surveillance capitalism is unethical. Mm -hmm. It's not that we don't like it. It's an unethical. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Moshe. That's why, that's why I asked the question. But at the same time, they are so powerful. They have so much money, you know, that is very difficult. Um, because it, it would be like, okay, would a conference take uh, funding from a tobacco company or from a, you know, whatever drug uh, dealing company or something like this? And in a sense, you know, it's a little bit similar. But their power is unprecedented. Um, okay, thank you for this. I would like to um, uh, go to an... Okay, Ricardo, you talked about what we should be talking, and uh, this is a question for the associations, and I don't remember seeing in your presentation. Uh, we have had not had a renewal of the computing curriculum in uh, uh, several years, many that I can uh, remember. I think since 2013, we haven't had a rehaul and uh, a whole over of the computing curriculum. 
Could we be teaching something new other than uh, what we are doing now? Should we abandon some of the subjects? Because in the last seven years, mm. lots of things have changed. Yet our approach to teaching computer, uh, computer science has not changed that much. And uh, this is a little bit the question for Ricardo and then for Gabriele and then for us, maybe. Just a quick comment. 2020, a new set of recommendation did come out. I believe. So 2013 okay. was updated in 2020. Right. Is it okay? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so if um, I, I would not comment on the, on the curriculum, I, I think that that's something that, that is done periodically, and as Moshe said, it was renewed. Um, I think there's a more deeper problem. Education hasn't changed in 500 years. I think that there's a, this is the main problem. So we, we haven't changed how we taught, we, well, how we teach at universities in a very long, long time. It still is the same. Even when, with the pandemic, with uh, online classes, still the dominant way to, to teach is the same. So in addition to, to that, we need to teach uh, ethics of technology, and, and Barbara mentioned that, and also I mentioned that in my presentation. So ethics is a big, a big uh, uh, thing that we need to teach. Uh, I would say that, that we need to revise the way we do things. So for example, I always think that, that if, if we could erase our brain on everything we know about education, and then we take the technology we have today and we say, what is the best way to teach or to, to someone to learn? Um, we will not get, get the same answer that we have today, but the problem we have, we have this inertia and we have already encoded a, a lot of things in, in a lot of biases in our, in our brains. So for example, think that, that today I see a lot of people and, and, and recently Google announced uh, a degree on this that, that basically is threatening universities is people can learn by themselves uh, using the web. So a lot of that. So many um, self-taught people that already know maybe more machine learning than most of us, uh, just you looking at videos, uh, material and so on. This is something that we, we have to to consider how, so what things a person can learn by themselves, but we don't need a teacher. And then I will try to see, okay, where we need a teacher, where we need not really a classical teacher, but a mediator that, that basically, uh, like in the blockchain discussion, um, I see people that even get religious about these things and they don't understand the whole concepts. And, and even when they say, You're, what about the CO2? That's not true, that's, that's like, like a, fake news like the pandemic. So we need to, to have people for the real difficult problems where we have trade-offs between, for example, uh, climate change and, uh, for example, a business. For the, he, one, one, one important thing for me is proportionality. Proportionality of everything, the, the tool that you're using, the, the data you're collecting, the, the time you're storing the data, all these things are typically not well thought and, and that's part of the ethics of, of, of uh, application. Thank you, uh, Ricardo. Gabriele, Peter. Yes, so um, first of all, let me briefly comment on the curriculum aspect. Yes, the curricula are continuously updated and Moshe is right, just recently a new curriculum came up and we are also developing new curricula, not only for computer science, but also involving data science and other subjects. So this would be the what from a subject perspective. Um, I would say the most challenging question is not so much probably when you come then to the practical implementation of a curriculum, what to add. Answers to that can be found very quickly, but what to skip because the amount that you can teach in a curriculum is limited. So what can we give up? Is it necessary to still teach assembler? I don't know. So the answer to that is open, but I'm not going to discuss into that further. I have to say that I myself, I like to teach. I do teaching at my university. I like to interact with the students. But um, yes, I, I fully agree that the how we teach is the more important part. And Ricardo has already mentioned some things. For me, the most challenging problem is I would like to teach as a guide on the side of the students and not as the sage on the stage predicting the truth or pretending to know the truth. But this is not a scalable model. And we have increasing number of students, uh, which limits our capacity for doing really good teaching. So I'm, I'm really struggling. 
um, my ideal teaching would be to discuss in small groups with the students. We all know we only can do this with our PhD students, but of course not, not for, the graduate, for the undergraduate students. So as a general argument, what I try to do personally in my teaching and what I think is the most important thing to be taught to the students is critical thinking. Don't believe everything that is told to you. I'm sometimes mm -hmm. doing this experiment in mm -hmm. my class. I'm telling them two contradicting statements and the students note down everything carefully. And then I ask them, what did you write down? This and that. And I said, does it make sense? No. Why didn't you ask? We believe you. And I think this is something that we really need to break up. We need to promote critical thinking. We need to encourage the students to question what we are saying. And then teaching is also more interesting, but also more challenging for us. And then hopefully those students will be educated people who are maybe at least a little bit um, aware or alert against, for example, fake news because they don't believe anything they hear. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriele. Uh, we are getting to the uh, almost to the end of our panel, but I would like I saw here an excellent question for Barbara, uh, and it comes from uh, uh, Mendez Morales in the audience, and he asks something like this: Professor Liskov, uh, don't we still live now in a software crisis, but this time thanks to cybersecurity flaws and malpractices? So. Are we really that far from the software crisis of the 70s where the challenges seem to be individual programs, but now the dangers seem to be even higher? Um, yeah, that's a very clever question. And of course, it's absolutely correct. Then we had no idea how to build the programs. Uh, you know, I look back on the 80s when uh, in some sense, that was the origin of stuff like chat sites and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the attitude was taken that it was not the responsibility of the people running these sites to worry at all about the content. And if they had to worry about the content, it would slow them down and they'd never be able to get the technical stuff done. And um, you can see how wrong that was. So I would say, yes, we have a software crisis or we have a uh, computer science crisis. It's a much more serious one than the one we used to have because it brings up all these issues about ethics and laws and technology control and all the stuff we've been talking about today. These are huge problems that we need to face up to going forward. Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, we can extend this question to other uh, members of the panel uh, because so we talked about regulation and it's an interesting thing is now that companies tend to bury their responsibilities in 50 page long end user licensing agreements that nobody reads. And they are like, uh, uh, you know, these kinds of arguments where you say, yeah, all right, uh, you, you got it. I don't want to hear the rest. So the question is, are we that underregulated? Uh, does this uh, does this tie into a greater responsibility by software companies? I'm sorry to get back on this uh, the, this issue, but it seems to me that we are still at the core of their product. If we consider the automobile industry and uh, the other uh, utilities, we are holding our software companies to a much lesser standard than other basic needs providers. And computers are now at the foundations, the critical infrastructure of all of our society. So maybe we should look into that. Um, Moshe and then uh, Gabriela. So um, when people read the in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, they realize that uh, it sanctions slavery. And, and are horrified, wow, the, the Bible allows slavery. But, but if you read it, it says that if someone sell, sell themselves to slavery, they will go free after seven years. And this is incredibly important. This is society says, not all contract between consenting individuals are valid. Okay, society puts a limit on, on this kind of thing. So today we just accept it, for example, uh, there used to be, you know, 100 years ago, in then you, you sign a contract, indentured servitude, you became a servant, you signed a contract for 25 years. And if you try to leave it, the state would put you in prison. And today we say this contract is not legal. Okay. 
So we say society has an interest between, their societal interest is override consent between individuals. This is well established. Imagine that you buy a car and the car vendor would say, the automobile vendor would say, well, if the car, if the, if the tire blows up, we are not responsible. But every time you use, a, you use a computer technology product, the company says, we are not responsible for anything that happened. I'm sorry, I, I know this idea that, that regulation will stifle innovation, but technology now plays such an important and central role in our life. My colleague, uh, uh, you know, my colleague, one of my colleagues said, it's the operating system of civilization today. That for society not to have a say in these basic things in, in how we run our life, and we let basically we end up letting corporation, huge corporation, you know, by now the, the big five uh, has an equity of like $8 trillion. It's just inconceivable the power of this corporation. We let them do whatever they want. We basically are letting them run society. Mm -hmm. And the answer is, let's look at the US constitution. We the people of the United States of America. We the people, the people decide how to form a more perfect union. And of course, we all understand that too much regulation is problematic. And as, as Ricardo said, it's not about yes or no, it's about how to do it in a smart way. Thank you. Uh, Gabrielle, you had your raised yes. hand, and then Nuria. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yes, I, I agree partly. I was at the beginning, skeptical against regulation in a sense of overregulation, because it really can also create a lot of problems. And I would like to bring in another concern, Moshe, that you brought up yourself. There is a clear difference between legally correct behavior and ethically correct behavior. And I think it's even harder to put ethical correct behavior in regulations. Because on the one hand, there might not be a common understanding about what ethical behavior is in all aspects. Or on the other hand, um, it might not be really quantifiable in terms of, of regulations. So I'm afraid that if we put too much regulations, then we might be at the end even more unhappy because the companies would say, OK, I'm fulfilling all the regulations now but still they behave very bad, very poorly. So this is my concern that I have. But I do agree that maybe a, a certain level of regulation is better than no regulation at all. The example that you gave, Moshe, of the car blowing up and the software blowing up was, was really compelling for me. Nuria. Um, well, I'm 100% pro-regulation. I think it's extremely hard. To the, to the regulations, so I'm not an expert, but I do see the need, and I, I do see a clear need for it. Um, and just to take as an example, the attempt at a European level with the draft for the proposed uh, uh, European regulation on AI and the uh, prohibition that is explicitly stated in, um, in the regulation that Ricardo showed, where he says that, you know, no AI system, and there is an entire definition of what an AI system is, um, that subliminally manipulates uh, human behavior in a way that could be detrimental to their health or something like that, you know, it, it should be allowed, like it's prohibited. To me, that is prohibiting you know, video games, all the social media platforms, advertisement. I mean, we, we live in a world where our behavior is subliminally manipulated on a daily, on a, on, on a constant basis, right? So uh, it is so clear to me that they are not going to prohibit everything that in a sense, it, 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 it becomes irrelevant because you are like, why would they put such a sentence if you are not actually going to um, declare that the entire you know, tech sector is illegal, basically, right? So I think it is um, it is very hard to do the proper thing. And the other element that worries me, going back to Moshe's um, reference to the constitution, you know, we the people, is like, I think a, a, a big challenge that we are not um, um, investing enough on is education. I mean, we the people can make decisions if we know what we are talking about, if we understand you know, how the systems that we use work, if we realize the level of hyper you know, personalization of the systems that we use or the services that we use, if we understand that they're exploiting our weaknesses 
to the benefit of the companies, right? But most people don't know. So it is very difficult for us as a society to collectively decide how we want computer science to evolve or the tech sector to evolve if we do not know, we do not understand the technology that we use. And by we, I mean citizens, and I mean policymakers, and I mean our representatives. And that's why when I mentioned in the pillar of society and education, I said education at all levels, not only university education. And I think this is a huge challenge. And even in formal education, and that's why I've been advocating for teaching computational thinking. We have the big mistake of believing that the children of today are computer savvy. They are not. They are very good at pressing icons on a, on a screen, but that's as much as they know. I've, I've given talks to more than 10,000 teenagers in Spain. And at some point in my talk, I asked them, can you raise your hand if you have a mobile phone? And of course, they all think I'm crazy. I just landed from Mars. It's like, how could I not have a mobile phone? So they all raise their hands, you know, two hands. And then I tell them, OK, can you leave your hand on up if you know how to program your phone? And everyone brings their hand down. And maybe a couple of people leave their hand up. And I'm always very, very happy. And I'll ask them, OK, can you tell everyone what do you program in your phone? And every time I get the same answer. I program the alarm on my phone. And that's the answer that they give to me. So that's the level of knowledge, really. And so this is the level of education of the next generation of children that are growing in this world where our existence is being modulated, influenced, and almost decided by software. Software that they don't understand, they don't know it exists, and they don't know what to do with it. So this is extremely dangerous because what we have is an elite that is non-diverse from any perspective, neither geographically, nor institutionally, nor demographically, an elite that is really is deciding what the entire planet you know, is doing without their understanding and without their knowledge. And I'm not sure uh, we have enough acknowledgement of this, and I'm not sure we are being ambitious enough in addressing this challenge, which from my perspective is a huge societal challenge that is also related to other societal challenges that we see in terms of you know, fake news, polarization of society, you know, and so forth. A lot of it is lack of education of understanding how these systems work. Thank you so much, uh, Nuria, for this uh, uh, passionate uh, statement. I think uh, we should uh, bring the panel now to a close. We are going over time and this is not the NBA. So um, I would give by everybody 30 seconds to express their uh, 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 last thoughts and then we, uh, oh, by the way, we have, I've seen, I have dozens of questions here on this court. Um, I, uh, uh, especially for the slides of the panelists. So if you are willing to share your slides, I'll be willing to make them available on our university website. Uh, please uh, let me know. And uh, we are going to make this video also uh, available if the panelists agree. And uh, for me, I just want to say heartfelt thank you for being here for your time and for expressing your views. Just one final sentence, which is a paraphrase on a sentence that was said in Houston at Rice University, I think in 1963. We choose to regulate, not because it is easy, but because it is hard. Okay, uh, Gabriele. I just would like to say thank you to you, um, Joachim, because I think you have shown that it's possible to lead a diverse and inspiring discussion, and I would be happy to continue this in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriela. Forrest. Yeah, this has been great. I think that I've been so impressed with how all the speakers have really talked about the impact of the technologies you know, that we're all in the middle of today. I, I just say that I think there's no one answer to these questions, even within the computer society. I'm sure we have a, a range of opinions, but I think what has to change is that we have to be part of that conversation and bring the technical realism to the debate of these big, heavy issues. So thank you all for that. Thank you. Barbara. Um, well, I, I certainly enjoyed the panel. It brought off lots of interesting uh, discussion. And so I think it served a very important purpose. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Okay, Ricardo. Yes, uh, I, I, I just wanted to continue with Nuria was saying with this important, even if, if we regulate, even if that Article 5 appears, uh, we maybe may have it like GDPR. We have Article 22 where we can contest something and then the person, well, the institution that should regulate that, which is uh, in, in Ireland, has only resolved 1% of all the cases that have been brought to their concern. So even if when we regulate, we don't enforce. That's the next problem. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, Joachim, a great panel. Thank you. Nuria, get the last 30 seconds. Oh, well, I think I said enough, so, <laughs> so I just wanna uh, thank you uh, for organizing this great panel, for giving me the opportunity to um, interact with such a distinguished uh, scientist that I admire. And for me, it's been a great uh, pleasure and a great honor. And I am uh, a positive person. So I do think that we have a great future in computer science, but we cannot be ignorant or naive about the challenges that we face. Thank you all. The honor has been all mine, and I look forward to uh, additional opportunities in the future. Bye for now. <laughs>